Once again today we greet you in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Appreciate you being here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, I appreciate the fact you tuned in to this hour coming up. And if you get on your phone out there and call a shut-in friend and have them to tune in, well, we'd appreciate it so very much. This is Preacher Edward speaking. We're coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And stay tuned now for the next hour and get the singing and the message. Take your Bible today and turn to Romans chapter 13. It's page 1207 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm going to speak today on this subject, Oh, No Man Anything. Uh, the number of the tape would be 369. If you'd like to have the tape, the music, the singing, the message, just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me tape number 369 or send me the tape entitled, Oh, No Man Anything. Uh, send it out to you for a gift of $3 for each tape, and a gift is used to help defray our radio expense. My wife and I, Brother Tony Crawford's mother and dad, were up in uh, North Georgia around Lula and Brookton on Thursday night. We went over to the Catfish School there in the old schoolhouse, and where our good friend, Brother Hugh Walden and Bobby's wife, operates. Very kind people, very nice people, always a large crowd there. And uh, we never been, but we didn't want to go back again. Nobody's ever gone there in that great place and eat, but we didn't want to go back again. And if you live in that vicinity, if you've never been, you ought to go. That's, they're located right near Highway 52, then near Brookton, and you meet some fine people. A lot of good old mountain people coming in there, city people. And country people, well, you just meet some fine people, and a lot of them there at the Catfish School. Somebody heard a lady, two ladies talking the other day, and one of them said, well, have you been married since I saw you last? It's been many years. She said, yes, I've been married four times. She said, the first time I married a millionaire. The second time I married a movie star. The third time I married a preacher, and the fourth time I married an undertaker. She said, well, anything significant about the order of that, those marriages? She said, yes, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. And so she had everything in order. Turning, please, to Romans chapter 13. While you're turning there, I want to give you a few Bible questions from book number four of my Bible questions and answers. Everyone should know. For more than 40 years, I've been preaching on the radio. I've had many of these ask me, and I've tried to answer them according to the scriptures. And on page four of my book number four, you'll find the answer to these questions. Where did God say the rust on people's money will be witness against them? Where did God say he would search Jerusalem with candles? Where did God say man would hunt his brother with a net? What animal in the Bible spoke with a man's voice? What man was cast overboard in the sea without a life jacket, without a lifeboat, and many miles from the shore, and yet he did not drown? Does the Bible say Jesus fell under the weight of the cross? Where does the Bible let us know that Palestine is in the center of the earth? What two men in the Bible committed suicide in the same manner? Where in the Bible is riches first spoken of and with whom is it connected? Where in the Bible does it imply that uh, the Arab nations will be wealthy in the end time? Of course, you know that's now. They're wealthy through their oil over there, and the Bible lets you know about that. Okay, where is the first and last place of the synagogue mentioned in the Bible? 
What did God say was sweeter than honey in the honeycomb? Where's the first war mentioned in the Bible? What did God decide to divide? When did God decide to divide the sections of the land and sea? Where did God say he bought the people, brought them out of an iron furnace? These answers on page four of book number five, you can get these books for $2 each. I have uh, five of them. This is book number four. I'm sorry. You can get them for $2 each or you can have all five for the gift of $10 and the gift is used to help try to get together for a reprinting of another book. I have the answers ready but not enough money to have them printed and the money is used to help defray our radio expense and stamps and whatnot and getting out the gospel in the way of booklets and so forth. Now I hope that Bible is now open at Romans chapter 13. Before I read, let me give you my mailing address. Going to speak on the subject, Owe No Man Anything. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the high powers, but there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that to which is evil, be afraid, for he bath not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenge to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. Now, that verse of Scripture right there knocks down these so-called conscience objectors that become cowards and afraid to go fight for their country, such as the Russellites, Jehovah Witnesses, so-called, a lot of these are cowards, spineless, no backbone, call themselves conscience objectors during wartime to, so somebody else can go fight for their country. And uh, they're just a bunch of cowards. I don't care who they are. That, that verse of Scripture knocks that down right there. The Bible said, be subject to the powers that be for conscience sake. If your government calls you into the Army, Navy, or Air Force to go fight for your country, you're to go. And God said, go for conscience sake. Because the government is the power that be, and you be in subjection to the powers that be. Defend your land. I went and fought for this country in World War II, and if I was a young man, and we got in war again, I wouldn't mind going fighting for it the second time. But I'm too old for that, but my grandchildren may have to do it sometime. All right, number five of Romans 13 knocks down all conscience objectors, Russellites, Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses, so-called cowards, and those that use a broomstick for a gun in time of training. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon the very thing. Really, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is, whom is custom, custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Verse 8 is my text. Owe no man anything but to love one another, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Owe no man anything. Now, borrowing, now I want you to follow me closely that you misunderstand this message. I'm trying to help you. We're the greatest indebted nation. We're in debt more than any nation in the world. During the speech of our president the other night, during that some 45 minutes that he spoke to Congress, the nation would in debt some five billion dollars, understand. No, I'm sorry, 15 billion dollars, 15 million dollars, I'll get it straight. 15 million dollars, if I listen correctly to the House Speaker afterwards. 15 million dollars in debt, even while he spoke. This nation is going in debt more than five million dollars every 15 minutes. Without stopping, without ceasing. We are far, far in debt in this nation. And not only that, but human beings, citizens of this country, 
have so gotten themselves into debt until they can hardly breathe. We're actually living today on borrowed money as individuals. There's not many people today that's not in debt. It's your money. And I'm not preaching against that. Borrowing is not prohibited in the Bible, but it's discouraged. God warns about striking hands or becoming surety. And I'll read a verse script in a moment. Explain to you something here. I owe money. I'm paid on bills. I always pay my bills. I don't beat anybody out of anything. I always pay my bills on time. Never let them go over. And that's where it should be done. And I owe some money. And you owe some money. But you don't have to go out here and borrow money over your head to try to keep up with the Joneses and others that you think is trying to outdo you and act a fool, get yourself in debt until you can hardly live. That's a sin. Christian people need to be careful about how they go into debt unless they absolutely have to borrow something to survive. In Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 18, a man void of understanding striketh hands and become a surety in the presence of his friends. What the Bible is saying there, that you uh, shake hands with this man and you're borrowing money or loaning money and you have friends around you. And then if you're not careful, you may lose that man as your friend. And you have witness to prove for what you've done. And if that man doesn't pay you, you've gone surety for him, you sign a note for him, it means the same thing. You've gone to the bank or the finance office, you've borrowed money, you've signed a note for somebody, and they wouldn't meet their obligation and made you angry, and you could feel like a, a giving a whipping, and you lost a friend, and he showed you he was not your friend because he wouldn't pay his note on time, he wouldn't pay what you signed for him to pay, or you wouldn't pay back what you loaned him. Now that's what he's talking about there. And the Bible says there, a man void of understanding striketh hands and become a surety in the presence of his friends. If you don't know what you're doing, you better be careful how you loan a man some money and you better be careful how you go on a note for some individual and sign your own life away, your own home, your property, your little savings. That's been done many, many times and God warns us about that. Now we're warned against going deep into debt. We're to be cautious about leading others into debt. And you can very easily damage friendship. There's some of you right here in this church, no doubt, and in the radio listening audience, you lost friendship with some individual because you stood for a debt he owed or you loaned him money or he loaned you money. He stood for a debt for you to pay and you didn't do it. And now you won't speak to him, he won't speak to you, and you'll feel like whipping each other. And you did wrong when you did it. Now that's what God is warning us about in the Bible. You've got to be careful about these things. And another thing that's very dangerous today that many of our dear women and some men come addicted to, and that's these credit cards. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 26, Be thou not one of them. Now, if you have a pocketbook full of credit cards and you go into a store, you'll jerk that card out and buy something you wouldn't pull your pocketbook out and pay for. And you buy it and put it on that credit card. You go in and they say, well, I got this item on sale, 10% uh, off. You say, well, I better buy that. I I really don't need it, but since it's on sale, I go ahead and buy it, and out comes your credit card, and you buy it. Then you turn around and pay about 21% interest on what you bought there. Did you, did you gain anything? No, no. You didn't gain a thing. People that sold the item did, and you went ahead and thought she was getting into bargain, turned around, bought the thing, and then turned around and paid interest on a credit card and paid more on that interest you would have if the price hadn't been down on the item. See, it's always a shrewd way for people to get you hooked. And a lot of people are addicted to these uh, cards. They'll go out and buy and buy and buy. And then they'll check up and find out they have overloaded their credit cards. They bought too much. And all the year long, they'll strain and strain and try to pay for the money they bought on that credit card. And many around Christmas time will overload their credit cards and 
and strain all the year long trying to pay that money back uh, plus that interest. Now, listen to me. There's nothing wrong in using a credit card if you know how to use it. If you use a thing and then pay it off before the interest is due. You don't owe the people in the store anything. You paid them for their goods. And you don't owe them anything by paying them a little interest. Well, you need to pay the thing off as soon as you get it before the interest becomes due. If you don't, then you have been sucked in and it's costing you. I don't have any credit cards, don't any. They send me some once in a while, cut them up and throw them in the trash can. Some of you sitting out there, you got your pocketbooks full of them. And you go in on a day whenever you got a sale on. And you say, well, I really don't need uh, this, but since it's on sale, I'll go ahead and buy it anyway. Bang, stamp it on this card. And you'll buy far more stuff you don't need on a credit card than you'd ever pull cash out of your pocket and pay for and some of you are addicted to it and it's a temptation to you. And you know when you go to town, I'm not going to buy anything today. Well, leave them cards at home. If you're not going to buy anything, leave them at home. You go stick yourself in debt and then you come back grieved about it and your husband get all over you about it and vice versa and there you have a problem. Now the question of debt in the Bible presents a servant relationship. The person you owe money to, you have become their servant. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. If you owe a man some money, if you have borrowed it, you've gone in debt, whether it be a man or individual, a banker, system, you have become a servant to that person you owe to. Oh, you say, I'm free. I, I'm a free man. I can do what I, you, you, you're a servant. Your servant to that person that you owe to. And he's got you, buddy. And he'll make it rough on you. If not, you're going to have to fight about it or go to jail or lose friendship or run your own credit reference. Because you are a servant. And every time you borrow money, you become that person's servant. I know, I know many of us would never be able to have a home to live in. Never have a car to drive if we didn't have to borrow it. I know that. And I'm not fussing about that. I'm guilty of that. And you are. And I'm not preaching against that. I'm, I'm trying to tell you to use a little common sense. Now, a lot of these people are high pressure you. They say, come on and buy now. And you can pay uh, three months later. Your payments won't start now. If you buy it today, you start your payments the, the first of, of, of May. But what they don't tell you is when you come in and get your John Henry on the dotted line, you pay all that interest in line for me, high interest. Not only that, but when you buy a house, you pay for that house two or three times in interest. You borrow uh, $100,000 to buy a home, 50000 and all you do for the next, uh, uh, say you got a loan for 30 years, all you do for the next 20 some odd years is just about pay interest. And you pay for that home about three or four times before it ever becomes yours. Now, we wouldn't have a home if we couldn't buy it on the credit. I could never have one. Probably most of you couldn't. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you could save your money and buy your home and, and go step by step in that manner and wouldn't have to pay out all the interest? You walk in, you say, sir, I, I want to borrow $50,000 and uh, I'm going to buy me a home, build me a home. The banker or the lender say, oh man, I'm glad. Yes, sir, come on in. We're glad to accommodate you. <laughs> He's not accommodating you, buddy. You're accommodating him. That's the way he makes his living. That's the way he makes his money. You're accommodating the banker. He's not necessarily accommodating you. And you become a servant to that banker. And uh, you, you're, under, you're under his power and dominion. You pay him or else. You may get your home halfway paid for, and then you can't pay for it. You say, fork her over, buddy. You've been a servant for me for many years, and I'm glad to use your interest. You haven't paid anything on your house yet, maybe a few dollars on the principal. You'd be surprised how little you pay on your property when you get a long-term loan. This whole nation's going crazy, going in debt today. We're all living over our heads, all of us living in debt and that's why this whole nation owes more than any other nation in the world. 
Now you need to do some thinking, get down to the ground, and be careful how you go and buy and buy and buy and buy on the credit. You pay an interest, you're making yourself servant to a lot of people. Everybody you owe, you're servant to them. Well, you like it or not, you're not free. You're servant to them. You're free in a sense, but you're servant to them. Now in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7, the rich, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Did I just tell you that? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, the borrower is a servant to the lender. If I had the money to loan you and you come and say, preach, I'm going to borrow $1,000, you're my servant, buddy, that you paid me back. The borrower is a servant to the lender. And you sitting back there today, and many of you have so many people, your servants too, until you can hardly breathe. You can hardly live. You can hardly pay your bills because you're servant to a lot of people. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 23, you're bought with a price. Be ye servant, be ye not ye servants of men. You don't have to be a servant to anybody no longer than you can possibly help. And don't just keep going on and going on. Sooner or later, get your head above the water. Get out of debt and quit being a servant to people. I was visiting a preacher friend of mine in Atlanta some time ago, and at that time he was living in the community where they had uh, homes, $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 homes in that community. You know what he said to me? He said, Brother Edwards, he said, you don't see anybody in this community in the daytime. Not a soul. You didn't visit every house in this community, and you won't get a soul to the door. I said, why? He said, both the man and the wife is having to work to make the payment on these houses and their payments run $1,000, $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 a month just to make the payments on these houses. And most of that is interest. And both of them have to work and nobody's at home during the day because they're enslaved. They're enslaved to the people that borrowed the money from them. They become servants. And nobody can stay at home anymore because they become slaves. If you were free, you could stay at home. Keep the house, watch out for the youngs, let the husband take care of the bills. But when you become slaves to the extent it takes husband and wife both to work to pay the bills and the youngs, God knows uh, what happens to them, then uh, you're a slave. And it's damaging your children, no doubt, many times. Parents should warn their children when they get married not to go too deep in debt. You parents, you, if you have a young couple that's thinking of marriage, uh, a ceremony sooner or later, matrimony, talk to them about this business of going in debt. You need to try to get out of debt as quick as you can. You don't have to have a brand new automobile every year, a boat under the carport, uh, a new suit of clothes every month or so, or keep up with the styles, away with these styles. These things you call styles have wrecked a lot of our people. A lot of these women go buy a new dress every month because the others are going out of style. I'm going to let you on a little secret if you don't tell anybody. Don't let this get out because I don't want these merchants to know this, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret if you won't tell anybody. If you will keep that dress or that suit long enough, you'll be back in style pretty soon and you'll wear it again. Now, why do they change styles? So they can sell them. That's why they, they, they know you don't want to buy the same thing you bought the last day. You want a new style. And they'll change the styles and they know when to change them, how to change them. Here you go in, out with that card, buy it because it's now in style. And then uh, uh, maybe you might want to give it away when it goes out of style. But if you keep it, it'll be back in sooner or later. I got suits I've been wearing 15, 20 years. That's right. I come to this pulpit a lot of Sundays with suits and clothes I've been wearing more than 20 years. They have been in style and out of style so many times it's not, it's not funny. And as long as they don't have a lot of holes and patches on them, I'll be wearing them again. And they'll be coming in out of style some more. I have a number of clothes. I'm not bragging about it. My people... Uh, sometimes the church give me a suit of clothes. Sometimes my family buy me a suit of clothes. I wear them, I hang them up, and uh, wear the summer clothes in summertime, winter clothes in wintertime. And those things hang there year in and year out. And I've given a lot of them away because I don't wear them out. They just hang there. I don't get to wear them just a few times, and then, uh, then the season's over. 
And uh, things happen like that. Just keep them. Hold on to them. They'll be back in style pretty soon. Now, people who overspend or create large debts are likely to lose sleep. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 27, If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? That man you owe is going to get your bed. You're not going to be able to sleep because uh, you owe him some money and you, you can't, won't pay it or can't pay it. Now, you didn't intend for that man to get your bed. You didn't intend for him to rob you of your sleep. That simply means uh, you, you can't sleep at night because of your debts. Now, when you went in debt, you didn't, you didn't intend for that to take away your sleep and be showing all over you and it'll age you. And your people uh, notice that you're growing older and more crabby and fussy and growl all the time, fuss on the wife, fuss on the children, and vice versa. And so don't, don't let a man take your bed away. And that's exactly what he'll do if you loan money and can't pay it, your sleep's gone. That issue you got into judgment all about, any concern and, and any good to common horse sense, and it, it, just a little bit honest, you got a bunch of crooks in the land today, Brother, they wouldn't pay you. Any, they wouldn't pay you any attention. They wouldn't pay anything. They they get all they can, but they never pay any of it back. That's what you call a thief and a crook. The Bible said uh, in the in the, the Word of God says in the Bible that if a man borrows and don't pay again, get the Scripture Psalms thirty seven verse twenty one. The wicked borrows and payeth not again. A man that will borrow and borrow and borrow and refuse to pay his debts and don't care whether he pays or not. You know what God said he was? He's a wicked man. Now what did God say about the wicked? The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations will get God. Now there comes a time of illness. A time whenever you can't meet your obligation. And you borrowed your money and, and you did it uh, with uh, goodwill and good desires to, to do it and to do good. And you had uh, hardship, sickness, heart, a problem. you had problems, troubles, and you got yourself in a jam. Get on your feet as quick as you can and run to that man that you owe. Sit down and say, listen, mister, I got, I, I'm just, I have a problem. I've, I, I just can't meet that obligation today. I've had sickness. I had to buy medicine for my wife and and uh, I'm just, I'm just in turbulence. Sir, would you uh, bear with me a little longer? If that man is any businessman at all, he'll bear with you because he'd rather do that than you run out and not pay him at all. So he's going to take a chance on bearing with you. But if you keep dodging him and, and then you don't go back and tell him again and work, get him to work with you on the thing, then you're going to be listed as a wicked barrier. You're branded as a wicked man, and that man's going to brand you as a crook, as a thief, as a liar. And he has a perfect right to do so. Then God told Israel if they would obey him, they would not have to borrow anything. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 12, the Lord shall come upon thee, his good treasure, the heaven, the heavens to give thee rain in thy land in the, his season, and to bless all the works of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto him only on, 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 on a nation and not to borrow. In other words, the Bible said then, Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 12, if you live for God every day of your life, you do that which is right, use a little common sense and don't cram yourself into debt before you get started and, and move along as you possibly can and honor God. God said you don't have to borrow anything. You'll be in shape to do some lending if you want to. That's what he said. Read Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 12. Now, financial pressure will do some things for you that shouldn't be done to any born-again Christian. Number one, a man that's overloaded in debt, that can't meet his obligation, that dodges a man on the street that he owes, that won't answer the door when he comes to collect. And a man like that, if he's a saved man, he's going to be so low spiritually sooner or later until he can't touch God with a 10-foot pole. He's been robbed of his spiritual power and joy. That'll hurt him. That'll fix him up. It can cause problems between a man and his wife. I mean, many of a man and wife is fussed and quarreled all day because they had no money to spend, no money to pay their bills. The wife says to the husband, you, 
you're no good, you're a poor manager, you can't manage anything, you shouldn't try to start in business to start with, and you know you couldn't manage anything. And uh, they're fussed, and they're quarrel. And that caused a friction between the husband and the wife, and they can't pray because no need them praying. God said for men and his wives, first to know one another, don't pray because God don't hear your prayers. And that gets the children involved in the thing, and that hurts them. And the whole family is, is hurt, and, and it's a terrible thing. You need to be very careful about going in debt. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It'll keep you in bondage to others. You walk around in bondage to all that. You owe this, owe that. I'm in bondage. I'm a servant to this. I'm a servant. I'm in bondage. You're not in a free man. You're not in liberty to be a free man and serve God like you ought to in that condition. Now, if you have to borrow to survive, take care of your family, meet your obligations, and use a little wisdom and some common sense, and uh, there's nothing wrong in it. It's better if you didn't. There's nothing wrong in it, though, if you have to. The Bible doesn't condemn it in that sense. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. So you can't serve God and, and be all tangled up out here and obligated in this money business. You have a, a, other people, on the other hand, are so tight and stingy. They rob God, deprive their families of what they need, deprive themselves of better health, and, and they have locked themselves down, and, and they're not spiritual because they rob God day in and day out. And a lot of times a person can get so far in debt until you know what you say? You said, I can't tithe because I owe too much. Tell that to the birds, not me, because I might be able to smile at you. Me and uh, God don't agree with you on that in the Bible. You all to yourself out there. That, that's a foreign language to God's word in the Bible. I just, uh, I got a job, got an income, but I just owe so much I can't tithe. Tell that to the birds. Don't tell it to intelligent preachers or people that love God because they know better. Anybody that has an income, if it's only $10 a week, if it comes out of social security, welfare, I don't care how it comes, if you get $10, a dollar, that's God's. When you get your check at the end of the month, whether it be social security or whatnot, you take God's part out first. That's God's money. It's not yours. Don't steal God's money. You might need some help later on and can't get it. You owe that to God. You tithe your income. I don't care how small or how large it is. You do it. But a lot of people ram themselves in debt. And they say, I got an excuse. I can't pay my bills because I owe too much. <laughs> isn't that something? That's funny, isn't it? That's sad. No, it's not funny. Because no Bible-believing preacher will agree with you. And the Bible doesn't agree with you. And God doesn't agree with you. So you're out there on your own talking to yourself and talking to the world and the weak and the ungodly. You're not, you're not making any excuse to people that know better because uh, the Bible teaches different. I've had it hard all my life, but I always give God his part and done my best. And God's seen me through so far, and he's going to see me through on to the end. And so I'm not worried about that. That don't faze me because I try to tithe my income, give above my tithe every week. All right. Now you get in that condition, but I don't care how much you owe. That does excuse you from giving God his part because it's not yours. It's God's. And if you keep it, you're taking God's money and you're robbing God. You spit it on yourself. And when God comes to collect, he's going to collect with interest. He said, all right, I want all that money that you took of mine as my tithe. And I'm going to add a little interest on that. And I'll just collect her all in one big uh, collection. Bad. Let's hear what Brother James has to say. Brother James said something over in the New Testament. Go to now you that say today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year. And buy and sell and get game. Whereas you know not sure it shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. For what you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, do this, that, and the other. James chapter 4 and verse 13. Take a lesson from Brother James. Don't go out and borrow too much money that you can't pay back. Nothing wrong if you have to borrow a little. We all do. We couldn't make it. We've so uh, teed ourselves up and geared ourselves up until we have to borrow a little. Except uh, a lot of people uh, got it and don't have to. God bless them. I'm glad they got it. 
Then there's a lot of people that's got it and overdo it. They squeeze it and it's tight and stingy and rob God and, and damage themselves, damage their own health, deprive themselves of necessities of life because they just old bunch of skint flints and tight wads and made uh, money their God. Now you could criticize Jesus, the church, the preacher, and they'll grin and look at you, but you touch that pocketbook and they'll go all to pieces. That nerve goes down that pocketbook, they'll go all to pieces, they'll turn red in the face, has the nerves all to pieces. They don't want to talk about their money because that's their God. But you can talk about Jesus, you can talk about Michael, you can talk about the church, you can talk about the preacher, you can talk about other Christians, but don't you touch my money. If you mention that, then me and you had it. I'll, I won't be talking to you no more. Now that's when money becomes your God when you get in that condition. Oh, you say now, preacher, ever you done made me mad today, and uh, I'm not going to invite you to my house to eat. Don't worry, honey, I've been here 30-some years, and I ain't never been invited out yet. I might have, uh, one or two have carried me out. I don't know, I may have eaten in somebody's house in the last 30-some odd years. I don't know since, I mean, 40 years, 40 years have been around here. I may have eaten in one or two homes. That's beside the point. I don't have to have your groceries. I got some on. And I don't want to be where I'm not wanted. If people wanted me to eat in their house, they'd invite me out. Since they don't, they don't want me to eat there. So that's all right me. I buy my own groceries. Now I've been here in Athens 40 years, and I can count the homes I've eaten in on these, this hand right here. I'm not asking you to have me in your home. I don't want to come in your home and eat if you don't want me. No, sir. Don't invite me in.